Hello class, this is Emergency Care and Transportation of the Sick and Injured, Chapter 4, Communications and Documentation. In this unit, and after this chapter, presentation, and related coursework, you will have an understanding of therapeutic communication, the means to communicate effectively with special populations such as children, geriatric patients, and hearing impaired and visually impaired patients, methods and procedures for effective communication, and the components of effective written reports, types of written reports, and ways to correct errors found within written reports, documentation of refusal of care, special reporting situations, use of medical terminology, communication systems and equipment, and regulations and protocols governing radio communications and communication with medical control and hospitals. Communication is the transmission of information to another person, whether, whether it is verbal or through body language, which is nonverbal. Effective communication is an essential component of pre-hospital care. It is necessary to achieve a positive relationship with your patients and co-workers. Verbal communication skills are very important for EMTs. They enable you to gather information from patients and bystanders, it makes it possible for you to coordinate all of the responders who are often present at a scene, and it is an integral part of transferring the patient's care to the nurses and physicians at the hospital. Documentation is the written or electronically recorded part of the patient's permanent medical record. It demonstrates that proper care was delivered, and it communicates the patient's story to others who may participate in the patient's future care. Adequate reporting and accurate records ensure the continuity of patient care. Complete patient records guarantee proper transfer of responsibility, comply with requirements of health departments and law enforcement agencies, and fulfill your organization's administrative needs. Radio and telephone communications link the EMT to other members of EMS, fire department, and law enforcement communities. You must know what your system can and cannot do and how to use the system most efficiently and effectively. Therapeutic communication uses various communication techniques and strategies, both verbal and nonverbal and encourages patients to express how they feel and achieves a positive relationship with each patient. The Shannon Weaver communication model was developed to assist the mathematical theory of communication for Bell Telephone Labs in the late 1940s. This model remains a valuable tool for understanding human communications. This is how it works. The sender takes a thought encodes it into a message, sends the message to the receiver, the receiver decodes the message, and then sends feedback to the sender. The figure on this screen illustrates how the Shannon Weaver communication model works. The table on this screen lists the factors and strategies to consider during communication. Age, culture, and personal experience shape how a person communicates. Body language and eye contact are greatly affected by culture. For instance, in some cultures, direct eye contact is impolite, while in other cultures, it is impolite to look away while speaking. Tone, pace, and volume of the language offer clues about the mood of the person communicating and also provide insight into the perceived importance of the message. Ethnocentrism is considering your own cultural values to be more important than those of others. People tend to translate messages they receive using their own worldview. Cultural imposition means forcing your cultural values onto others. Healthcare providers may consciously or subconsciously force their cultural values onto their patients because they believe their values are better.
Eye contact and body language are powerful communication tools. Pay attention to body language, both your own and that of your patients. Physical cues will help you and your patient to truly understand the message being sent. When you're treating a potentially hostile patient, it is important that you understand and be aware of your own body language. Stay calm and try to diffuse the situation. Assess the safety of the scene because, again, your safety and that of your crew is the most important thing. Do not assume an aggressive posture. Make good eye contact, but do not stare. Speak calmly, confidently, and slowly. And never threaten the patient, either verbally or physically. Physical factors to consider are the following. First of all, noise is anything that dampens or obscures the true meaning of a message. Literal noise, sounds in the environment, such as lighting, distance, or physical obstacles, may affect your communication. Cultural norms often dictate the amount of space or proximity between people when communicating. As a person gets closer, a greater sense of trust must be established. Your gestures, body movements, and attitude towards patient care are critically important in gaining the trust of both the patient and any family that may be present. With verbal communication, one of the most fundamental functions of EMTs is to ask patients questions. Open-ended questions require some level of detail in the response and use these whenever possible. For example, what seems to be bothering you? Closed-ended questions can be answered in very short responses. The response is sometimes a single word like yes or no. Use this only if patients cannot provide long answers. For example, are you having trouble breathing? You may miss important issues if pertinent questions are not asked. You can use many powerful communication tools when trying to obtain information from patients. Facilitation is encouraging the patient to talk more or provide more information. Silence gives the patient space and time to think and respond. Reflection is restating a patient's statement and this is made to you to confirm your understanding. Empathy is being sensitive to the patient's feelings and thoughts. Clarification is asking the patient to explain what he or she meant by an answer. Confrontation is making the patient who is in denial or in a mental state of shock focus on urgent and life critical issues. Interpretation is summing up the patient's complaint to confirm your understanding. Explanation is providing factual information to support a conversation. And summary is providing the patient with an overview of the conversation and the steps that you will be taking in their treatment. There are various interviewing techniques, but when you're interviewing a patient, consider the careful use of touch to show caring and compassion. Touch is a powerful tool. Use it consciously and sparingly. Avoid touching the patient's torso, chest, or face simply as a means of communication because these are often viewed as intimate. Some interview techniques to avoid are providing false assurance or reassurance, giving unsolicited advice, asking leading or biased questions, talking too much, interrupting the patient, using why questions, use of authoritative language, or speaking in professional jargon, which they might not understand. Friends, family, and bystanders may be valuable during the patient interview process. Be sure to allow the patient to answer if he or she is able and wants to, even if well-meaning family members attempt to answer for the individual. Do not be afraid to ask others to step aside for a moment while you talk to the patient. 
you may need to decide if having family and friends nearby will help or hinder care. Some golden rules of communication. These are here to help calm and reassure a patient and are tried and true. Make sure and keep eye contact at all times. Provide your name and use the patient's proper name. Tell the patient the truth and use the patient or language that the patient can understand clearly. Be careful what you say about the patient to others and be aware of your body language. Make sure to speak slowly, clearly, and distinctly. If the patient is hard of hearing, face the patient so he or she can read your lips. Allow the patient time to answer or respond. Act and speak in a calm and confident manner. When communicating with older patients, make sure to clearly identify yourself, present yourself as a competent, confident, and caring individual and professional, and do not assume that an older patient is senile or confused. You may encounter hostility, irritability, and some confusion, but do not assume this is normal behavior. Approach an older patient slowly and calmly. Allow plenty of time for the patient to respond to your questions. Watch for signs of confusion, anxiety, or impaired hearing or vision. The patient should feel confident that you are in charge and that everything possible is being done for him or her. Above all, be patient. Older patients often do not feel much pain and may not be fully aware of important changes in their body systems. You must be especially vigilant for objective changes. When possible, give the patient time to pack a few personal items before leaving for the hospital. Locate any hearing aids, eyeglasses, and dentures before departure. Older patients are often worried about the safety of their home, valuable items, and pets. Share these concerns with the person assuming care of the patient at the hospital. Remember that emergency situations are frightening to anyone. Fear is most obvious and severe in children. Children may be frightened by your uniform, the ambulance, and a crowd of people that could be potentially gathered around them. Let a child keep a favorite toy, doll, or security blanket. If possible, have a family member or friend nearby. If practical, let the parent or guardian hold the child during evaluation and treatment. Be honest. Children easily see through lies or deception. Tell the child ahead of time if something's going to potentially hurt. And respect the child's modesty. Make sure to speak in a professional yet friendly way and use appropriate tone and vocabulary for their age. Maintain eye contact and position yourself down at the child's level. Do not tower over a child. This seems intimidating and frightening to them. Communicating with hearing impaired patients. Most people who are hard of hearing have normal intelligence and are not embarrassed by their disability. Make sure to position yourself so the patient can read your lips or see your lips. With hearing aids, be careful that they are not lost during an accident or fall. And they may be forgotten if the patient is confused. So ask the family about the patient and whether or not they use a hearing aid or hearing aids. There are steps you can take to effectively communicate with patients who are hard of hearing. Make sure to have paper and pen available. If the patient can read lips, face the patient and speak slowly and distinctly, but don't exaggerate or over-exaggerate your normal speaking gestures. Just speak normally and never shout. It's totally useless and they find it offensive 
as a matter of fact. Make sure to listen carefully, ask short questions, and give short answers. Learn some simple phrases in sign language. It can be useful to know the signs for sick, hurt, and help. Communication with visually impaired patients is what we're going to discuss now. Ask the patient if he or she can see at all. Visually impaired patients are not necessarily completely blind and expect the patient to have normal intelligence. Explain everything that you are doing as you're doing it. Stay in physical contact with the patient as you begin your care. If the patient can walk to the ambulance, place his or her hand on your arm. Transport mobility aids such as a cane with the patient to the hospital. With guide dogs, they're easily identified by special harnesses. If possible, transport the dog with the patient. This alleviates stress for both the patient and the dog. Guide dogs are trained not to leave their masters. Otherwise, arrange care for the dog. A conscious patient can tell you about the dog and give instructions for its care. There is a good possibility that you may treat a non-English speaking patient. You must obtain a medical history even though the patient does not speak English. You cannot skip this step. Find out if the patient knows a few English words or phrases. Use short and simple questions. Point to parts of the body. Have a friend or family member interpret if they're available. Consider learning some common phrases in another language that is used in your area. Pocket cards that show the pronunciation of terms are available and use a smartphone app or website that can help you translate. Remember to request a translator for the patient at the hospital. Now let's discuss communication with other healthcare professionals. Your reporting responsibilities do not end when you arrive at the hospital. Effective communication between EMS providers and other healthcare professionals in the receiving facility is essential to effective and appropriate patient care. You must give an oral report to a hospital staff member. That staff member must have at least your level of training. Components of an oral report include opening information, which is the name, chief complaint, nature of the illness, or mechanism of injury for the patient. Detailed information that is not provided during a radio report and any important history that may not already have been provided. Also report the patient's response to treatment given en route, vital signs, and any other information such as details gathered during transport, known allergies, and patient medications that you potentially have brought with you. Now let's discuss written communications and documentation. The first thing we're going to talk about is the patient care report or PCR. The PCR is the common acronym and stands obviously for the pre-hospital care report. It is a legal document. In fact, all of your records and documentation are legal documents. The PCR records all care from dispatch to hospital arrival. There are two types of PCRs, written and electronic. The PCR serves six functions, continuity of care, legal documentation, education, administrative information, essential research record, and evaluation and continuous quality improvement. The following are examples of information collected on a PCR the chief complaint, level of consciousness or mental status, vital signs, initial assessment, and patient demographics. And those include age, gender, and ethnic background. 
A lot of administrative information for use in billing, research, and quality improvement can be gathered from a PCR. Examples include the time that the incident was, was reported, the EMS unit was notified, the EMS unit arrived at the scene, the EMS unit left the scene, the time the EMS unit arrived at the receiving facility, and finally, the time that patient care was transferred. There are two types of forms. The traditional forms or the traditional written form has check boxes and a narrative section. There is a computerized version or electric PCR and sometimes is referred to as an ePCR. And this is information that is filled in a computer or tablet device that uploads data over a secure internet connection. ePCRs allow patient information to be transmitted directly to hospital computers. The narrative section of the PCR may be the most important. The elements of the narrative section include the time of events, assessment findings, emergency medical care provided, changes in the patient after treatment, observations at the scene, final patient disposition, refusal of care, or any staff person who continued care, or the staff person who continued care. Be sure to include significant negative findings and important observations about the scene. Do not record your conclusions about the incident. Use clear descriptions that do not make any judgments about the patient's condition. In written documentation, avoid radio codes and use only standard abbreviations. Remember that the report itself is considered a confidential document. You should be familiar with state and local laws concerning confidentiality. Now let's discuss reporting errors. Everyone makes mistakes. If you leave something out or record it incorrectly, do not try to cover it up. Falsification results in poor patient care and may result in suspension and or legal action. If you discover an error as you are writing your report, draw a single horizontal line through the error, initial it, and write the correct information next to it. Do not try to erase or cover the error with correction fluid. Refusal of care is a common source of lawsuits, so thorough documentation is crucial. Document any assessment findings and emergency medical care given. Have the patient sign a refusal of care form. Have a family member, police officer, or bystander also sign the refusal of care form as a witness. Depending on local requirements, the PCR might contain a complete assessment, evidence that the patient is able to make rational and an informed decision, discussion with the patient as to what care or transportation EMS recommends, discussion with the patient as to what may happen if he or she does not allow care or transportation, discussion with family, friends, and bystanders to try to encourage the patient to allow care, discussion with medical direction according to local protocol, providing the patient with other alternatives, for example, going to see his or her family doctor or having a family member drive him or her to the hospital, willingness of EMS to return, and signatures. Above all, make sure that you complete the PCR and of course make sure that proper signatures and witness signatures are in place. Special reporting situations can occur and depending on local requirements you may have uh, special reporting for gunshot wounds, dog bites, certain infectious diseases, suspected physical or sexual abuse, or multiple casualty incidents, or MCIs. Now let's talk about communication systems and equipment. Radio and telephone communications link you and your team with other members of EMS, fire, and law enforcement communities. 
They help the entire team work together more effectively and provide an important layer of safety and protection. There are base station radios, and a base station radio is any radio hardware containing a transmitter and receiver that is located in a fixed place. A two-way radio consists of a transmitter and receiver. Mobile and portable radios are installed in a vehicle. Mobile radios are used in the ambulance to communicate with the dispatcher and medical control. An ambulance often has more than one radio. Portable radios are handheld devices. Portable radios are essential at the scene of an MCI. When away from the ambulance, a portable radio is helpful to communicate with dispatch, any other units involved, and medical control. There are repeater-based systems, and a repeater is a special base station radio. It receives messages and signals on a single frequency. It automatically retransmits them on a second frequency. This allows two mobile or portable units that cannot reach each other directly to communicate using greater power and antenna. This figure on this slide illustrates how a repeater-based system works. A message is sent from the control center to the transmitter by a landline. The radio carrier wave is picked up by the repeater for rebroadcast to outlying units. Return radio traffic is picked up by the repeater and rebroadcast to the control center. Now, digital equipment is part of EMS communications, of course, now and telemetry allows electronic signals to be converted into coded, audible signals. These signals can be transmitted by radio or telephone to a receiver with a decoder at the hospital. Data from cardiac monitors can be transmitted via Bluetooth-enabled mobile devices to monitoring centers, and digital signals are also used in some kinds of paging and tone alerting systems. EMTs often communicate with receiving facilities by cell phone or cellular telephone. A cellular telephone is simply a low power portable radio. Satellite phones or sat phones are another option. Conversations can be easily overheard on scanners, so always be careful to respect patient privacy and speak in a professional manner whenever you use any form of EMS communication system. There are other communications equipment available. For example, ambulances usually have an external public address system. EMS systems may use a variety of two-way radio hardware. Simplex is push to talk and release to listen. Duplex is simultaneous talk listen. And multiplex utilizes two or more frequencies, which enables more than one transmission to occur simultaneously. Med channels are reserved for EMS use. Trunking systems or 800 megahertz systems use the latest technology to allow greater traffic. An interoperable communication system allows all of the agencies involved to share valuable information with one another in real time. Mobile data terminals or MDTs inside an ambulance receive data directly from a dispatch center, allow for expanded communications capabilities, and one example is that for that is maps. Now with radio communications, the FCC or Federal Communications Commission regulates all radio operations in the United States. The FCC has five principal EMS-related responsibilities. It allocates specific radio frequencies for use by EMS providers. It provides the licensing for base stations and assigning appropriate radio call signs for those stations. 
It establishes licensing standards and operating specifications for radio equipment used by EMS providers. It also establishes limitations for transmitter power output and it monitors radio operations. The FCC's Rules and Regulations Section Part 90 Subpart C deals with EMS communications issues. The dispatcher receives the first call to 911, and the dispatcher has several important responsibilities. They properly screen and assign priority to each call according to predetermined protocols, and select and determine the appropriate EMS response unit or units. The dispatcher directs EMS response unit or units to the correct location. They coordinate EMS response units with other public safety services until the incident is over and provide emergency medical instructions to the telephone caller. The dispatcher assigns appropriate EMS response units based on several criteria the nature and severity of the problem, anticipated response time to the scene, level of training of available EMS response units, and the need for additional support. The dispatcher should give the responding units the following information. The nature and severity of the injury, illness, or incident, exact location of the incident, the number of patients, responses by other public service agencies or public safety agencies, screen directions or advisories such as adverse road or traffic conditions or severe weather reports and the time that units are dispatched. EMTs report back any problems that took place during a run to the dispatcher and EMTs inform the dispatcher upon arrival at a scene. The arrival report should include any obvious details observed during scene size up. Radio communications must be brief and easily understood, and speaking in plain English is best. Report only important information. Now, communicating with medical control and hospitals. The principal reason for radio communication is to facilitate communication between you and medical control and the hospital. Medical control may be located at the receiving hospital, in another facility, or sometimes even in another city or state. Consulting with medical control serves several purposes. It notifies the hospital of an incoming patient, provides an opportunity to request advice or receive orders from medical control, and advises the hospital of special situations. Plan and organize your radio communication before you transmit. These are the best tips to give a proper patient report. Follow the standard format established by your EMS system. Include nine elements, your unit identification and level of services, the receiving hospital and your estimated time of arrival or ETA, the patient's age and gender, the patient's chief complaint or your perception of the problem and its severity. Also include a brief history of the patient's current problem, a brief report of physical findings, a brief summary of the care given, a brief description of the patient's response to treatment provided. Make sure to determine whether the receiving facility has any additional questions or orders. Report all patient information in an objective, accurate, and professional manner. Remember that people with scanners may be listening. Let's discuss the role of medical control. Medical control is either offline, which is indirect, or online, which is direct. Depending on how protocols are written, you may need to call medical control for direct orders or permission to conduct certain tasks, administering certain treatments, determining the transport destination of patients, or stopping treatment and or not transporting a patient. 
In most areas, medical control is provided by the physicians working at the receiving hospital. But many variations have developed across the country. The link to medical control is vital to maintain a high quality of care. There are a number of ways to control access on ambulance to hospital channels when calling medical control. The dispatcher monitors and assigns appropriate clear medical control channels. Centralized emerge, excuse me, centralized medical emergency dispatch or resource coordination centers exist. The physician on the other end bases his or her instructions on the information the EMT provides. Never use codes when communicating with medical control unless you are directed to by local protocol. Make sure to repeat orders back word for word and then receive confirmation once you receive an order from medical control. Do not blindly follow an order that does not make sense to you. Now let's talk about information regarding special situations. You may initiate communication with hospitals to advise them of an extraordinary call or situation. A small rural hospital may be better able to respond to multiple patients from a highway crash if notified when the ambulance is first responding. Some other special situations include hazardous materials situations, rescues in progress, and multiple casualty incidents. When notifying the hospital of special situations, keep several points in mind. The earlier the notification, the better. Provide an estimate of the number of individuals who may need to be transported to the facility. Identify any special needs the patients might have, such as burns or exposure to hazardous materials, so that you can help assist the hospital in preparation. And then follow the plan for your system. Now, maintenance of radio equipment is, of course, vitally important. Like other EMS equipment, radio equipment must be serviced. The radio is your lifeline. To other public safety agencies whose duties include protecting you and to medical control. At the beginning of a shift, check radio equipment. Radio equipment may fail during a run. The backup plan must then be followed. Standing orders are written documents signed by the EMS system's medical director outlining specific directions, permissions, and sometimes prohibitions regarding patient care. When properly followed, standing orders have the same authority and legal status as orders given over the radio. Okay, class, thank you for your time and attention. Let's do some review questions to cover the material that we talked about here in Chapter 4. The first review question. When healthcare providers force their cultural values onto their patients because they believe their values are better, they are displaying A, ethnocentrism, B, proxemics, C, nonverbal communication, or D, cultural imposition. The answer is D. Forcing your own cultural values onto others because you believe your values are better is referred to as cultural imposition. Let's look at the other options and see why they were incorrect. To remind you of the question, when healthcare providers force their cultural values onto their patients because they believe their values are better, they are displaying A, ethnocentrism. That's incorrect because ethnocentrism means considering your own cultural values as more important is not the same thing as cultural imposition. Proximix is the study of space and how the distance between people affects communication. That's obviously not the correct answer here. C, nonverbal communication. 
And that's incorrect because nonverbal communication refers to any communication that does not use language. So, of course, D is the correct answer. When you force cultural values onto a patient because you believe your values are better, that's displaying cultural imposition. Review question two. When communicating with an older patient, you should A, approach the patient slowly and calmly, B, step back to avoid making the patient uncomfortable, C, raise your voice to ensure the patient can hear you, or D, obtain the majority of information from family members. If you look at this question carefully, I'm sure you can easily come up with the correct answer. And the answer is, of course, A. Approach an older patient slowly and calmly. Use him or her as your primary source of information whenever possible and allow ample time for the patient to respond to your question. Not all older patients are hearing impaired. And if the patient is hearing impaired, you may need to elevate your voice slightly, but don't shout. It's insulting and they absolutely find it so. So elevate your voice slightly so that they can hear you clearly. Let's look at the other options and see why they were incorrect for this particular scenario or question. To remind you, when communicating with an older patient, you should A, approach the patient slowly and calmly. We just discussed why this is the correct answer. The other options are incorrect and let's look at why. B, step back to avoid making the patient uncomfortable. That's incorrect. You may need to get closer and of course you have to touch the patient to take vital signs. Raise your voice to ensure that the patient can hear you. That's incorrect because not all older patients are hearing impaired. Um, the other option is obtaining the majority of your information from family members. That's not correct because you want to get most of your patient from the patient. Always speak to the patient because the patient's responses can provide unlimited information. Review question three. While caring for a five-year-old boy with respiratory distress, you should A, avoid direct eye contact with the child as this may frighten him. B, avoid letting the child hold any toys as this may hinder your care. C, avoid alerting the child prior to a patient procedure. Or D, allow a parent or caregiver to hold the child if the situation allows. I know you can easily get the answer to this one correct. And it is, of course, D. When caring for children, take special care to avoid upsetting them. Allowing a parent to hold the child or allowing the child to play with a favorite toy often helps keep the child calm. Never lie to a child or any other patient for that matter, but children can easily see through lies and deceptions. Assure the child that you can be trusted and you are there to help by maintaining eye contact with them, gain their trust. Let's look at the other options and see why they're incorrect. When caring for a five-year-old boy with respiratory distress, one option you were given was A, avoid direct eye contact with the child as this may frighten him. With children, eye contact helps to establish trust with them. Sometimes adults may find that threatening uh, especially given certain circumstances, but with children, they're carefully reading your face. So maintaining eye contact is very important to gaining trust with children. Another option you were given is B, avoid letting the child hold any toys as this may hinder your care. The exact opposite is true. Playing with a toy can calm a child and help keep them occupied. You were also given the choice of avoid alerting the child prior to a patient procedure. That doesn't work. Never lie to a child because they can detect deception. And then, of course, we talked about why allowing a pa parent or caregiver to hold the child is the correct answer. 
Review question four. Which of the following pieces of patient information is of least pertinence when giving a verbal report to a nurse or a physician at the hospital? A, the patient's name and age. B, the patient's family medical history. C, vital signs that may have changed or D, medications that the patient is taking. If you read this carefully, I'm sure you can easily prioritize and get the correct answer. And the correct answer is B. Information given to the receiving nurse or physician should include the patient's name and age, vital signs, especially if they've changed, a summary of past medical history, and the patient's response to any treatment that you rendered. Family medical history is not essential in the emergency treatment of a patient. So we already discussed in that summary why uh, B was the correct answer. So I'm not going to review these others. Um, if you need to, you can return to the following or preceding slide and Everything you need to know about why B is the correct answer is included, including why A, C, and D are the most important pieces of information to give to a nurse or physician at the hospital. Review question five. Which of the following statements about the PCR or patient care report is true? A, it is not a legal document in the eyes of the law. B, it cannot be used for patient billing information. C, it helps ensure efficient continuity of patient care. Or D, it is intended for use only by pre-hospital care provider. Remember, which of the following statements about the PCR is true? The answer is C. The PCR is an important document for more than one reason. It helps to ensure efficient continuity of patient care by providing the hospital with an account of all pre-hospital assessments and treatment. It also serves as a legal document that reflects care provided by the EMT. Let's see why the other options were incorrect. To remind you of the question, which of the following statements about patient report is true? A, it is not a legal document in the eyes of the law. Of course that's not true. It is a legal document, as are all documents that you generate. Uh, B, it cannot be used for patient billing information. That's not correct because a patient care report can be used by hospital administration, which does include, of course, the billing department. We already talked about C being the correct answer because, of course, it is true that it helps ensure efficient continuity of patient care. Now, D states it is intended for use by only pre-hospital care provider. Well, while it may not be read immediately by the hospital, it can be used later to review patient care procedures and for quality improvement purposes. Review question six, a device that receives a low frequency signal and then transmit it at a relatively higher frequency is called a duplex, B, a scanner, C, a repeater, or D, a receiver. The correct answer is C, a repeater receives messages and signals from one frequency and then automatically transmits them on a second higher frequency. Let's look at the other options and see why they are incorrect. To remind you of the question, a device that receives a low frequency signal and then transmits it at a relatively higher frequency is called a duplex. Well, that's false because a duplex is the ability to transmit and receive messages simultaneously. Basically, it's open channel. B, scanner. That's not correct because the definition of a scanner is a device that searches or scans across several frequencies until a message is completed. C, repeater is, of course, the correct answer, and we already discussed why. But let's look at receiver, which is incorrect. And the reason that's incorrect is a receiver is actually 
a device that only receives and does not transmit. By its very name, you understand the definition of what a receiver is. Question 7. When treating a potentially hostile patient, you should try to diffuse the situation by A, assuming an aggressive posture, B, staring at the patient, C, speaking calmly, confidently, and slowly, or D, verbally threatening the patient. I know you can easily get this one correct. And the answer is, of course, C. Speak calmly, confidently, and slowly. With your backup clearly visible, advise the patient what needs to be done or provide the patient with limited acceptable choices. For example, sir, I need you to please sit down on the ambulance cot now. Either you will sit on the cot or we can help you to the cot. So let's look at the other options and see why they aren't useful in handling a potentially aggressive patient. So, to remind you, when treating a potentially hostile patient, you should try to diffuse the situation by A, assuming an aggressive posture. Well, of course, this is incorrect. Do not assume an aggressive posture. Stand with your palms facing out, because this communicates openness and acceptance and allows for quick movement, if necessary. B, staring at the patient. You always want to make good eye contact, but do not stare. With a potentially hostile patient, that can be seen as a sign of aggression and definitely is not your best option here. C, speaking calmly, confidently, and slowly with a potentially hostile patient is, of course, the correct answer. And we discussed this in earlier chapters. The more calm you are, the more calm the patient is likely to be and the more calm the entire scene is likely to be. Your last option was D, verbally threatening the patient. Well, we've talked earlier about why verbally threatening a patient is not uh, a good thing, either verbally or physically. And of course, you open yourself to potential legal action as well. Number eight. All of the following are functions of the emergency medical dispatcher except A, alerting the appropriate EMS response unit, B, screening a call and assigning it as a priority, C, providing emergency medical instructions to the caller, or D, providing medical direction to the EMT in the field. This one should be obvious, so let's look at the correct answer. And it is, of course, D. The functions of the emergency medical dispatcher include screening a call and assigning it as a priority, alerting appropriate EMS response units, coordinating EMS units with other public safety services, and providing pre-arrival emergency medical instructions to the caller. Their job is not to coach you as an EMT in the field. Absolutely not one of their roles and responsibilities. So I'm not going to review this question because basically we just went over everything that they are responsible for and certainly what they are not responsible for, which is coaching you in the field. And this is the remainder of question eight. And again, we've completely covered everything in question eight in terms of all of the possible answers. Question nine. After receiving an order from medical control over the radio, the EMT should A, carry out the order immediately, B, disregard the order if it is not understood, C, obtain the necessary consent from the patient, or D, repeat the order to the physician word for word. So read this one carefully. Let's see what the correct answer is. D. After receiving an order from medical control, the EMT should repeat the order back to the physician word for word. This will ensure that he or she heard the order correctly. After confirming the order, the EMT should obtain the necessary consent from the patient. So you want to repeat the order back to the physician so that you're clear on exactly what you're instructed to do. And then, of course, before you do anything to a patient, always obtain consent. 
So let's look at the other options and see why they're incorrect. To remind you, after receiving an order from a medical control over the radio, the EMT should A, carry out the order immediately. That's incorrect because the order must be repeated back to confirm that it was heard correctly. B, disregard the order if it is not understood. Well, of course, that's incorrect because you want to repeat the order so it will help the EMT to clarify any misunderstandings. C, obtain the necessary consent from the patient. Well, this is correct. However, this step is carried out after the order has been confirmed and understood by the EMT, which is, of course, covered in D, which is repeating the order to the physician word for word. That way you're clear and then obtain consent from your patient for treatment. Now our last review question, number 10, when requesting medical direction for a patient who was involved in a major car accident, the EMT should avoid A, using radio codes to describe the situation, B, questioning an order that seems inappropriate, C, relaying vital signs unless they are abnormal, or D, the use of medical terminology when speaking. Okay, read this one carefully. Now let's look and see what the correct answer is. This A, when we're giving, I'm sorry, when giving a report to medical control or requesting medical direction, the EMT should avoid the use of codes such as 1050 or signal 70, for example. One cannot assume that the physician is familiar with these codes. Always use plain English when speaking because it's more effective and terminology you use in the field is not the terminology that the physician uses in the hospital. So to avoid confusion, just speak in plain text or plain English. Let's look at the other options and see why they are incorrect. Just to remind you, when requesting medical direction for a patient who was involved in a major car accident, the EMT should avoid A, using radio codes to describe the situation. Of course, that's the correct answer, and we just discussed why. The other option you were given was B, questioning an order that seems inappropriate. If an order seems inappropriate, EMS providers must question the validity of the order. But it doesn't apply necessarily to the scenario that's outlined in the question. C, relaying vital signs unless they are abnormal. Okay, if you are requesting medical direction for a patient who was involved in a major car accident, uh, the EMT should avoid relaying vital signs unless they are abnormal. And this is not the correct answer to the question because vital signs are necessary to describe the patient's condition to the medical director. And D, the use of medical terminology when speaking. Well, the use of appropriate medical terminology shows the EMS providers confidence, knowledge, and expertise to the medical director. So medical terminology that's correct is medical terminology that's correct, and it's used at every level of medicine from EMR up. Thank you for your time and attention in this chapter. I appreciate it. We look forward to working with you in Chapter 5.